Meryl Fury and Ajay Shah, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Well, thank you. Yeah, hi, Good thank you. Yeah, Good to I should, see you. I should say, welcome back, Meryl. Um, all right, so um, you guys you guys are up to some stuff. P um, people will know a little bit about you, Meryl. You've, uh, you've been here before, but why, why don't we get Ajay to introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. All right, Ari. Again, thanks for inviting me, and it's an honor. I know a lot of things about your podcast and about your show, so it's definitely a big honor. Myself is a cardiologist. Uh, I practice you know, as an employed cardiologist in a small hospital. Uh, a few years back, I went and got board certified into lifestyle medicine, and that has been a, an eye-opener. As a cardiologist for the last 27 years, I realized that some of the things we do in cardiology is essentially putting a Band-Aid on a larger problem. And uh, many times I would prescribe, you know, a complex medication, do a lot of procedures, but that was only a temporary thing for patient to come back in a few months, few years with another heart attack, another stent, another bypass surgery. When I got certified in the lifestyle medicine, I realized that when I help people to change their lifestyle, not only it helps their heart disease and it reverses it, and it stops it growing, but it also helps the whole body, including the blood pressure, including the diabetes, including even the, some of the other conditions like the obesity and fatty liver and many other things. So I've been more focused now for the last two, three years on how to educate people on lifestyle medicine. Matter of fact, uh, I think uh, your show is the first uh, official announcement that I just gave notice to my employer of uh, resigning as a cardiologist and I'll be practicing full-time as a lifestyle physician. It was a pretty big, bold move because, because our country is not ready for lifestyle medicine. There's no money into lifestyle medicine. Cardiologist makes at least twice, if not three times more money than a lifestyle medicine physician. But our country truly needs a lifestyle medicine physician, otherwise, our country will go bankrupt if we have everything done by the cardiology. So that's where I stand now. I'm hoping today to talk about a, a raging epidemic more than even COVID-19 and that's obesity. So let's dive into lifestyle medicine and obesity. <laughs> okay, it's a, it's a deal. Um, I was, before you mentioned the money, I was gonna ask you about the money because I've had cardiologists on the show before and sometimes during the show and sometimes talking off the record, they tell me that they get um, chastised and sometimes reprimanded by their departments for, for um, decreasing revenue. Right? Like if you're, not, if you're not doing, you know, uh, I guess a bypass surgery and stents are good money and I'm telling someone to go home and eat brown rice and broccoli isn't. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I think, uh, see, the model we have in America is essentially a sick care model. Until the patient gets sick, nobody gets paid. So hospitals make a lot of money if patient gets sick. Doctors make money if patient has a chest pain. But if patient just comes to see me and says that I feel good, I make zero dollar. So keeping people good feeling, there's no money into it. And that's where this paradigm shift needs to happen, where we start paying doctors and hospitals and healthcare insurance companies and organizations for keeping people healthy. And that paradigm shift is happening already. For example, in Kaiser Permanente in California, Southern California, that model is already working. And that model, I think, gradually is going to grow across the country where we actually get paid for keeping people healthy. Mm. So I have a question that I'm, I'm tempted to ask you, Ajay, but I'm going to ask Merrill instead, yes. which is give you know, so someone who trains as a cardiologist, and you may not be able to answer this. I don't know how, how far back you go with Ajay, but someone who trains as a cardiologist, like gains a lot of really important skills and knowledge, right? Like we're not, we're not diminishing the, um, the incredible education and experience that a cardiologist has and can provide when needed. You also have a cardiologist who makes a good living from doing that. I know, Meryl, you, you've, you've worked in healthcare for a long time. What got into, what do you see in Ajay that, that would allow him to walk away 
Like, I don't think I could, I would do it. Like, honestly, like I'm, I, I'm, I've got my skill set. I'm proud of, I'm getting paid for it. I'm getting positive feedback from people that I'm helping. I would not walk away. Yeah. What do you, what do you see in Ajay that, uh, that allows him to do that? If you, if you think you could answer the question, you know, Howard, you and you have the best questions. It's, it's, I just love chatting with you. I love mm-hmm. it. Um, so here's what I see in Ajay. He is a man with a heart and a conscience. He does not really seem to enjoy, and I'm sorry if you're hearing the roosters crowing in the background over here. I don't know <laughs> how much of that you can hear. Um, but he does not seem to enjoy just taking money and watching people stay sick and put them on the treadmill of, you know, being sick until they die, the downward spiral. Um, He has a lot of integrity. And I think a person who has that point of view and that, you know, that angle that they come toward life, it is exceedingly difficult to stay in the typical American medical industry slot. And actually um, maintain your self-respect over time. You know, uh, he and I have actually had some very good conversations about what it would mean to retire Hmm. and uh, what would he do instead. And that's one of the things that that I think just it, it sort of has been eating at him is the way I see it. You know, he wants to actually help people get well. He wants to get to the root cause of people and their illness and how to get well and how to make that something that happens within a person's own home on a moment by moment, day by day. There's my dog barking (laughs) basis. Um, Your dog has a a, a podcast sensor. It's like, oh, it's time time to be loud. Time to be loud. And I'm going to, as soon as I'm done telling you this, I'm going to get up and let him in. But that's what I see in Ajay, an amazing integrity and um, beautiful spirit with a person who had probably this very high hopes and high ideals and plans when he went into cardiology and went into medicine and did everything that had to happen to just to get to that point, because that's a lot just to get to the school and then go through schooling and go through the residency and all of that. Um, He's he's he's. uh, just an amazing person and decided, you know, after so many years, I don't know how many years he's been practicing as cardiologist that, okay, he did that for long enough. He tested that path long enough. And, uh, you know, his heart now is somewhere else. Hmm. See, I is it good that I didn't ask you that question. Cause you probably wouldn't <laughs> yeah. have said I have a huge heart and I'm full of integrity, <laughs> but there it is. You heard it. You heard it here. Um, oh, thank you, Merrill. Yeah. Thank you. So, I mean, I, I'm, I'm listening to an audio book by a doctor, uh, I think it was written in 2016, 2017, and he quotes this, the a statistic of 46% of MDs experience burnout. And I'm wondering whether that was something that you were experiencing as well. I think that's a good question. Being a solo cardiologist for the last five years at my hospital, it played a role in terms of being burned out. I was on call a lot during the month. I covered pretty much everything cardiac related in my hospital. So there was a party, the burnout. But I think my bigger burnout was the frustration with the system where people keep coming back. My practice kept growing. Instead of uh, having a feeling, instead of having a feeling that I cure somebody, nobody was cured. And I think physician by nature should be healer and should be the people who actually cure you of something. The current cardiology practice many times is, like I said earlier, it's very temporizing thing. It doesn't cure anybody. While if we go through the lifestyle, not only it stops the progression of disease, but it reverses disease and it cures many of the ailments you know, by the root. And I think I, I'm, I'm starting to realize that if I practice lifestyle medicine, I will need to practice for myself. So there will be some inherent benefit for myself to be healthier, to live long. So there is some selfish motive. The knowledge I have gained from the lifestyle medicine to take care of myself, I did not gain that knowledge as a cardiologist. I am actually a better healthy human being because of lifestyle medicine myself. So the benefits I have enjoyed myself are just so tremendous 
that I want to give back to the lifestyle medicine what it has done so much for me and my family. Mm. So let, let me ask you about that, um, about you know, cardi cardiology education. Is it that you didn't learn that these a lot of these conditions were healable or reversible or curable? Or did you in fact actively learn that like, these are chronic and there's nothing we can do about it except treatments and band-aids and statins and keep, you know, we can help keep people keep them alive, we can keep them comfortable, we can make help them live longer, but we really there's nothing you can do about the underlying disease. Like what was the message that you got, either both overt and, and subtle? Yes. Again, we got about five hours of nutrition training throughout the medical school residency and fellowship. So we did not have much nutrition training. We did not have that much preventative training because we were so busy, you know, turning off the uh, the, the mopping the floor instead of turning off the faucet. We were just so busy taking care of sick people that we did not realize that the, the way we can get this thing better would be by turning off the faucet instead of keep mopping the floor. So we were just too busy taking care of sick people. We did not have time to take a pause and reflect on the, on the right thing to do. We were just doing what was required of us. So it's almost like a soldier on a, on a battlefield, just firing aimlessly, it doesn't matter where the bullet is going until somebody stops and says that you're doing the wrong thing. You should be going out with a rose and a flower and you should be making a peace with your enemy. Here we were just fighting with the disease instead of working with the disease and reversing. Just the term fighting the disease itself makes me think that we are creating this uh, negative emotion of fight instead of making a peace with the disease. And I think lifestyle medicine, it's, I almost feel like lifestyle medicine makes a peace with the disease, makes a, makes a collaboration and makes almost like a working with the disease and reversing it instead of keep fighting with the disease. I think when I ask a patient to eat healthy food, I almost connect with their life better than I write a statin drug or I do a procedure. When I talk to them about what they eat, it makes me a better friend of theirs because now I'm getting into their personal life instead of just the disease state. And those things I think are actually the reason lifestyle physicians don't burn out because their visits with the patients are more of a joy almost more like an active meditation, talking about each other's life instead of just writing a medicine and then going to the next patient after three or four minutes. So I think uh, lifestyle medicine actually is good for physician too. Like you said, 40 some percent people burn out. The suicide rate is very high among cardiologists. You know, they actually don't advise their own kids to go into cardiology. Mm -hmm. And I think those are life, life's reality. And I think those things can, be modified and changed if we reverse this trend of just uh, sick care and we go into this healthcare and lifestyle medicine. And I think I see, and to be honest with you, I see in 10 to 15 years, physicians being paid for their cognitive talk and for their educating the people instead of just doing procedures and writing prescriptions. You know, pharmaceutical companies obviously have invested interest in to keep writing more and more medications. But eventually, I think we will have a model where we will be getting paid for keeping people healthy. Mm. I have so many questions about that. And um, one, I just, want, I just want to reflect that, like, what, like, first of all, are you a poet? Because, like, that's such a beautiful visual of the, the you know, just shooting bullets at random versus a, a flower. Yeah, uh, I mean, it's it's it, that really sticks with me, and the, this idea that um, that working with patients can be a meditation because most doctors I know would think that actually giving someone a statin is the way to have a better relationship with them. When you start poking around in their food and asking them about that, most doctors I know feel like they're overstepping or they're going to end up um, getting pushback or I don't want to talk about it, or the doctor is uncomfortable talking about it. Um, I mean, I'd, lo I'd love to hear more about your, your approach as this is a meditation for me to, be, to collaborate with you to become your friend, as opposed to uh, um, an expert practitioner, a vendor, just sort of dispensing yeah. something. 
Yeah, I think uh, like some of the things I do are is that I never stand and talk. I always sit down and talk. No matter how busy I am, I always go and sit down in the room. Many times in the hospital room, if there's no chair in the room, I sit right on the bed at the leg and I talk to them eyes to eye. And I personally feel, sometimes I even touch them. Sometimes even I hug them. I mean, I think to me, those qualities sometimes are frowned upon by lawyers and administrators, but those qualities have never failed me. Those qualities actually have made me only busier because when I give a hug to a person, his wife or his brother or his uncle, whatever, they become my patient in one month because they feel like I was their friend. So it was not just good for my own soul and my own mind, but it was good for business too because I think in being a nice person, most people who succeed in their life typically are the nice people. Jerks don't succeed. They may succeed for a few months, few years, but eventually either they go to jail or they commit suicide or they are miserably failing. You know, that, that's how the jerks go through in their life. And I don't want to be one of them. So I think uh, when I sit down and I talk to a patient about what they ate yesterday, it literally makes me feel like I'm sitting at the dining table in their house having a dinner with them. And when you get invited to a patient's house, and I've done that many times, when you get invited to the patient's house to have a dinner with them, there's no better way of making a relation you know, than ever before. And I think that's what many physicians are slightly lacking. I think uh, and that's where, I think again, the sick care model does not allow physicians because most physicians have about, you know, we get 15 minutes slot by the clock. Out of that 15 minutes, Harvey, we have to finish the notes and that takes sometimes four, three to four, five minutes. So that leaves 10 minutes. Sometimes we have to review the chart before we go in. That takes two, three minutes. So average physician spends for a return visit about six to nine minutes in the room. And how can you, how can you take care of a patient and the mind and the soul and the body and take care of multiple medications in those six to nine minutes. And only way a physician can do it is just go to the meat, you know, pardon my you know, pun here, you go to the meat, but just write the medicine and go, go out of the room. And that's not what, I, I was never like that, but now since the lifestyle medicine education, I'm just going away from it completely. Hmm. I love that. So it's, it's you, you could be a, you know, an advertisement, a recruitment advertisement for lifestyle medicine physicians. You, you make it sound so good that even I would do it. It is good. Yeah. It's definitely good. So, so Merrill, let's. Um, you've coordinated this this conversation. You introduced me to to Dr. Ajay. Um, what what are you up to that um, that brought all this all this together? What's what's the collaboration? Oh, so the collaboration is um, we came together like, you know, as so many people over the last year and a half, we met on Facebook online, I think, um, Dr. Shah and I did. Uh, he was able to see some of the live things and videos that I had done and um, we kind of got in contact and came up with this crazy scheme, this crazy idea that we could perhaps make a difference for, um, in particular, African-American women who struggle with obesity. And one of the, you know, part and parcel of that is, you know, coming to like a deep understanding of the culture and the barriers and the struggles and, you know, the physical side and the emotional side and the, you know, what happens with your partner side, all these different things that play into, um, you know, body image and health and weight and um, even like the economics of it and the, the what, where, where are you in a neighborhood and are, is it a food desert and what kind of foods do you have access to and what do we understand about all that? Anyway, we, we took all of that big ball of wax and we started doing live presentations on Facebook um, with the goal of making a positive difference for specifically African-American women, but of course it's not a, um, an exclusive conversation, mm. right? That, that conversation applies to anybody who has the issue and wants to listen. Yeah. 
so like let's let's uh, melt that ball of wax and see what what the, what the wicks are in there um like um i mean i was thinking about this in in like a month ago when when, when we thought the pandemic was going to sort of come to a close i actually traveled and i was staying in a hotel in a hotel lobby where i dropped off my car for you know for airport parking and there were three um people behind the desk, all of them were African-American women. All of them, I would estimate, were in the 250 to 350 pound range. Um, and, you know, and so like, like something in me just sort of notices that. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't necessarily like, you know, since working in this field, I'm, I'm not fat phobic anymore and I don't blame people for their situation, but still there's like, oh, this is, there's something going on here. Like, so can you break down a little bit of the, you know, the, the, the determinants of health and the determinants of weight specifically as, as, as it plays out in the African-American female population, just in terms, you know, sort of like a regression analysis in terms of like sure. what's, what's leading to it? <clears throat> sure. Now, this is a huge subject, right? Um, like, so we're going to tap our toe in the water around this iceberg. Okay, because it's a big one. Okay. But for sure, for generations, right? Um, African American females have been uh, encouraged to be on the heavier side for lots of reasons, right? So we can go all the way back to slavery, right? Um, and actually, you can go back to some of the cultures in Africa where larger bodies indicate more wealth, right? And that you have enough food that you can eat, that you can be a bigger person. Going, moving that forward into slavery, when uh, slaves were brought over and you know, it was time to go up on the sail platform, the women who were curvier and voluptuous were seen as the ones um, more likely to reproduce well, right? So there's that. And you can fast forward because of course slavery wasn't all about keeping slaves fat and happy. That's not what that was about, right? <laughs> so move forward from there. Wait, wait I, I, critical race theory. Uh... I know, I know, yeah. I know. Uh, I, yeah, it, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Right, right. The, yeah, the, right. Text, the textbook I read said that some slaves were very happy, you know. Yes, uh -huh. there was that textbook. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah that, that wasn't probably reality, of course, right? So anyway, uh, moving forward from there, then, you know, let's say gets past sharecropping days and into moving African-American people around to um, facilitate manufacturing and, you know, farming or whatever happened there. People were like subsistence, living subsistence lives, right? And again, um, genetically, we partially by selection of what happened in the slavery times, right? African American women tend to be curvier, right? That's part of it. Anyway, as we move forward, then there's like the the part that happens with maybe curvy body is seen as more sexually desirable. Right there's that. Um, I certainly have. I can talk about members of my family who are way way curvier and um, certainly heavier, and their male partners like that, encourage mm -hmm. that. You know, tell them they don't want any skinny girls. You know, so they. So so just just to to interrupt for a second, like that feels very different than talking about overweight and obesity with white women who who very much see it like like I'm you know I'm part of some Facebook groups where people are posting their their challenges and they're it's, you know the common theme is I hate my body uh, my boyfriend says I'm fat what can I do like like there's a total self-loathing not that it helps right it does it's not like that's an energy that actually helps people lose weight it's I would argue the opposite there's almost I'm almost thinking like that positivity of my body that, you know, I'm proud of it, I love it, it's good to be this heavy, could actually be a positive? Well, so there's this fine line too, right? So there's a point like, okay, so in my family, when I, 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 I'm, a, I'm more on the lean side, right? 
for whatever reason, genetically, I'm a lean person, right? Um, in my family, uh, we women were expected to be thicker, you know, have heavier thighs and heavier hips and, you know, just curvier. Um, and that goes to a point that's attractive and beautiful to a point. And then when it tips over into like morbidly obese, that's not still not seen as beautiful though, right? Mm -hmm. So curvy and heavy is good to a point and then it's not good anymore, right? And really, I guess one thing I would like to say along these, you know, in this conversation is we're not talking about fat shaming or putting anybody down or, you know, talking about, uh, you know, the negativity of being heavy specifically we're talking about the health component because Dr. Shah is a cardiologist and I'm a registered nurse. And what we see over and over again is obesity being like the keystone in so many different illnesses, right? Between high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, cancers, what you name it, diabetes is like a driver. I mean, I'm sorry, obesity is a driver in that. Mm -hmm. And that's really where we're coming from with this right. particular conversation. Okay. Right. So um, other, other other factors you talked about, you know, sort of zip codes. Sure, zip codes are a big one. Um, you know, so if you happen to be in a zip code that is, let's call it a food desert, there's no decent grocery stores and the only stores really where you can count on getting any kind of food is maybe the local mom and pop shop or um, a gas station or an, a convenience store where it's loaded with highly processed junk foods, high fat foods, processed meats, um, low quality oils and lots of sugar, all that stuff. I mean, people have to eat, so they're gonna get whatever they can get, right? Um, so that's certainly a problem. Yeah. And then the, the lack of knowledge, right? Just the not knowing and the whole you know, there's the, the social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to layer on that, like there's the media and the media has determinants of health. So mm -hmm. if all day long, what's pumped into your neighborhood or into your zip code or into the um, TV channels that you watch or whatever are indications that it's really good to go to Burger King, or it means a lot to eat a double quarter pound cheeseburger from Wendy's or you know, this energy drink is good or that bag of chips is the thing you should be having. That's what people learn, right? There, mm -hmm. we already, you know, already know there's, there's no mass marketing of what you said, what brown rice and broccoli you brought up earlier. There's just no push for that. There's nothing on TV or in the media that's going to say beyond, you know, there was a little time, there was a brief period where you could, hear about getting your five fruits and vegetables a day. Mm -hmm. I think that's past now though. I'm pretty sure that's past now. Mm -hmm. So people don't know and then act on what they do know, which is poor knowledge. Mm -hmm. so, um, I'm curious about, is there a diet culture? Cause you know, clearly there's, you know, there's tipping into obesity, which you know, can lead to joint pain and, and medical diagnoses and great discomfort. Um, at that point, is there a difference in sort of, you know, how African-American women think about weight and bodies and dieting? Because I've, you know, I've seen, I'm very familiar with the white world diet culture, which is, you know, a train wreck. Um, so I'm wondering if there's, you know, similarities and differences. I think there are similarities, you know. I don't think any woman is excluded from the cultural uh, ideal of beauty, right? Barbie comes in all colors and she oppresses all of us. Right? Well, what a great line. <laughs> She's terrible. She's a horrible witch, that Barbie. Um, so yeah, having a curvy shape, being voluptuous is one thing, but like I said, being um, beyond voluptuous, being overweight um, is not desirable. And then all of the usual mechanisms kick in, you know, 
um, lose weight in X number of days, X number of pounds per X number of days, try the paleo, try the keto, try the cabbage soup, try the Weight Watchers, try the, you know, you name it, it goes on forever. Um, it just may not get to a point where the woman, uh, an African-American woman might not feel like she needs to be a size two mm -hmm. to be beautiful. But we certainly get hit with all of the same messaging that every other woman gets hit with in America. Mm. Uh, so, so you have this Facebook group and you're working specifically with African-American women. What was, what was the impetus to bring in um, Dr. Shah? whom um, viewers will probably notice he's not an African-American woman. If, if I had to guess, I would say um, South Asian man. Yeah, Indian man. Indian man. <laughs> so. so I'm going to let Dr. Shah answer that one. So it's interesting how it started. I was sitting at actually a friend's house and we were doing some Indian songs. We were all singing. And I was just going through my Facebook uh, feed and I realized that consistently, whenever I have any African-American woman Facebook friend, they are at least BMI of 25, 30 or even higher. And this suddenly came to my mind that uh, that would be the group I would be most uh, successful in making an impact once I go into lifestyle medicine. This was about three, two or three, three months ago. Mm -hmm. And then I, th I started looking into the, my Facebook friends, who can I partner with? Because I also realized that if I go as an Indian man, or even if I was a white man, if I go with that kind of color and that kind of, uh, plus if I go as a cardiologist, many African-American women might get turned off that how does he know what we go through in our life, in our culture, in our, in our society, in our part of the country, in our zip code. So I thought I would need to partner with a able person who, is, who has a medical background, who is African-American woman, who has uh, gone through some family history of obesity. And I saw Meryl's uh, Facebook page and she was actually uh, you know, appointed as the president of a very respectable group, whole food plant-based group in Chicago. So I had seen some of her videos. I had actually talked to her a year ago about coming live on my page and it did not happen because of a variety of reasons. So I actually called her up that night and she was gracious enough to send me the message right back. We talked in 48 hours and we got live within one week. And that has been a great success. I mean, we are talking uh, not just the science, we are talking about culture, we are talking about soul food, we are talking about economic aspect, we are talking about uh, education aspect, we're talking about single, home, single mom families, we're talking about a lot of variety of things because African-American women and obesity is just not because what they eat. They have probably 20 other factors which plays a role. And that's what Marilyn and I are trying to dissect out ourselves. And we are actually learning as we are growing because uh, this problem has been you know, well described, but even our government doesn't have a handle on how to stop that problem. If you look at some of the statistics, African-American women, obesity is almost 55%. And like you said, the leanest segment of the population is white women, partly because of health reason, partly because of the whatever the reason they, they, they see their body. So it's exactly contrast that white women are the leanest compared to like white men, Mexican men, Mexican women, white men, white African-American men and African-American women. African-American women are the heaviest segment of the population. And that's where Marilyn and I want to make the impact because obesity is the reason many, many chronic disease happen, including diabetes, including cancer, including heart disease, including living less. African-American women live about four to five or less than white women. And all those things while living in America, and that to me is not acceptable. So even though we are making a small dent, I'm hoping that by being on your show, being on your podcast, we will stimulate many other people who will start their own small movement in their own community where they will make impact on 500,000 African-American women. And I told Meryl actually from the day one that we are not gonna make impact on millions and billions. We're gonna make impact on few hundred to few thousand people 
but every life we save, every obesity we prevent, particularly childhood obesity, we are going to be considered successful people. You know, I would add to that too, that not only is it issues of chronic illness, right? Now, for the last year and a half, we've been under the pressure of coronavirus mania, insanity, fear, you know, dread, all of the whole spectrum of, of emotions that go along with corona and COVID. And we have certainly lots of data that indicates the hardest hit of our population are people of color, right? Interesting, the correlation that some of the highest levels of obesity are among people of color. Right. And there is a correlation between obesity and cholesterol levels and outcomes for people who wind up getting really sick with COVID-19. So wouldn't it be amazing if we could make a difference for people by talking about stuff that they could manage themselves every day, assuming they have access to decent food? Mm. That would be so powerful. That would be like, you know, okay, I live my life purpose. I can die in peace now. If I could do that, you know, I have a, a niece, one, one of my most beloved, right, nieces. I know you're not supposed to have favorites, but I love this girl. Um, she suffered from morbid obesity, 52 years old. Morbid obesity, um, high cholesterol, beginnings of diabetes, type 2 diabetes, all this stuff. And she wound up... Um, succumbing to that in the throes of COVID and COVID-19 treatment and things like that, wound up dying of heart failure and pulmonary embolisms. Like, mm -hmm. you know, this doesn't have to happen like this. We actually have some control that we can take. If we're willing, then it takes being willing, right? Mm -hmm. It's easy to not be responsible for the food we put in our mouths. Yeah. But if we're willing to be responsible, it's a powerful tool. We don't have to be the most put upon people in the country, you know? Yeah. So I'm sorry to hear that. Um, okay. So one of the things that popped into my head as you're talking about that is, you know, you mentioned all the craziness around COVID. And, you know, one of the issues is the conversation around vaccines and around whether you trust the government and whether you trust big pharma. Um, and, you know, I remember the first week I was in graduate school for public health. And I heard some of my African American classmates saying and this was at Temple University, which was a largely black university, um, that they thought that AIDS was a government plot. And I was like, wait, what? Who, you know, and then I learned about Tuskegee. <laughs> and then I started, I said, Oh, you know, I don't know if they're right, but I sure get where they're coming from. And so, you know, hearing about vaccine hesitancy and hearing, you know, it, it seems to me that there's a fine line you have to walk in saying, because, you know, it's become such a polarized issue that I've, I've heard people, you know, talk about anyone who says anything about, well, you know, improve your immune system must be either a COVID denier or an anti-vaxxer because you can't be both. You can't both want to be having better health and believe in vaccines. So I'm wondering in the community, you know, what, what do you hear and how do you navigate that conversation to be, you know, fruitful and helpful? Do you know what I'm asking? I do. I think I do. All right. Well. Um, so uh, here's the way I put it. Whether you choose to get a vaccine or not, or wear a mask or not, or whatever you choose to do is an entirely um, very personal decision, right? Given that our federal government doesn't mandate things for very long, right? It, and if it's at a local level, it doesn't mandate for very long and people push back and that's the nature of being an American, right? So it's a very personal and individual decision. I encourage people always, I don't care if we're in the middle of a pandemic or not, stack the deck in your favor. Just eat healthy food all the time. 
Mm-hmm. It's not a, you know, oh my gosh, I can, I can prevent COVID or I can save myself from not getting this shot if I eat more brown rice and broccoli. It's a lifetime thing, you know? So I just encourage people to stack the deck in your favor, put at least two more servings of vegetables on your plate every day, okay? And then increase from there. Mm-hmm. Eliminate the processed stuff, which is not really food. That is a food-like substance that it's not food. <laughs> eliminate the processed stuff, eliminate the chemicals. Those are just put more of a drag on your body and your immune system and give your body the basic building blocks it needs to keep you as healthy as possible. That's mm-hmm. how I navigate the conversation. Mm-hmm. And I stay away from, as far as possible, giving people my personal opinion about any of it. Uh-huh, nice. <laughs> So one thing I was thinking, um, Ajay, when you were talking is, so you're, you're the cardiologist, you're the, you're the expert, um, and, you know, Meryl, you're, you're an expert too, but in a sort of diff- different arena. So you're bringing in another content expert and really, you know, the white coat, the doctor is like the ultimate expert in our society is, you know, or used to be, or in some ways. And what really struck me is that you came in, Ajay, as a learner more than the expert that you're like, explain to me this, you know, your lives, explain the culture, explain the determinants. I'm wondering whether, you know, as a coach, I find that curiosity is much more powerful than advice in terms of helping my clients change. I'm wondering if if that, um, if, you know, for both of you, if if that sort of coming in with sort of wide-eyed is like, what's going on here? Tell me about it really empowered people to look at their lives in a different way and begin to to find places to, to, to make positive changes? No, I think I agree with you completely. I think uh, not just as a physician, but just as a, any wise person, staying curious for the rest of our life is very important. If we have to be a non-staff student, I think uh, our studying doesn't stop just because my fellowship ended. And I think as I go through this process in my life, I'm realizing that uh, as I continue to learn new things, I've improved upon not just my personal life. Like I said, I'm healthier because if I learn about lifestyle medicine, but I'm also making a bigger impact. And I think I always, I always ask the patient that when you come out with five questions, I like you more than when you come out with one question. Because when you have five questions, that means you listen to me what I was telling you. If you were just somewhere else when I was talking to you, and if you had a, <coughs> if you had a zero question, that means you probably did not even listen to what I was telling you. So I think to me, a curious doctor and a curious patient, both are required. And in terms of the African-American women, when we talk to our audience, when we get engaged on Facebook, when they're writing their comments and their questions, we both, Marilyn and myself, we are actually more excited and happier that we are able to put the message across. So I think to answer your question, not just I want to be curious and a lifelong student, but I also want our viewers and our followers and our students to be also a lifelong student and also curious people. Mm. That's, yeah, that's so different from the medical model, which is the doctor is nobody's role model, right? Like, you, you know, like, you know, the doctor's out in the back court smoking, you know, behind the hospital, you know, nurses certainly aren't known for having the healthiest lifestyles. Um, but to hold, you know, I think for both of you to hold yourselves up as saying like, I am patient zero here, right? You, what I say and what I do have to be an integrity for, for, for me to deserve the platform of leader in this movement. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I think we have to be a role model. And unfortunately, you know, I think uh, physicians are not given enough credit because they are many times role model in terms of uh, how hard they work, how smart they work, how long of a training they go through. So they are role model in certain areas. So they have ability to be a role model for the society. It's not like they are not capable. They are capable of being a role model. And they're role model in many areas in life and in society. It's just that when it comes down to the self-care, unfortunately, many physicians 
are so much, uh, so much driven and so much uh, into just the passion about practicing medicine that they become their own victim and they become actually less of a self-care. And that's what I think I, I saw in myself 10 years ago, Harvey. I went through a major bout of depression and that was in the middle of my busiest career. I was seeing lots of patients. I was making very good money, a very successful practice. And I had a great family, great kids, but I did not take care of myself. I would be on call many times. I would pop a sleeping pill when I could not sleep. Sometimes I would have a drink or two when I was stressed out. And those things are not the quality of a healthy role model. And that's where I think uh, I'm going myself. Meryl is there already. I think, uh, I think if we set some examples, like at my hospital, Harvey, a lot of physicians, they are already not congratulated me and said that you did the right thing for yourself. They are saying that we wish we have a courage to do what you are doing it with this project. And I think I told them, I said, you all have a courage. You just need, you know, a little push, a little self-reflection, a little soul searching what the priorities are in the life. And I think right now our priority is to help myself, help my family and help as many friends and family and you know, people in the world as much as I can before I, lie, before I die. Because at this stage in my life, like when we started earlier, you said that if I was enjoying cardiology, if I was making money, it would be so difficult for me to leave cardiology field. But at this stage in my life, my bigger, bigger priority is to leave a legacy as an immigrant who came to America and not just made millions of dollars, and draw expensive cars and live in big houses. But I want to leave a legacy that he came and he contributed to the society in America and he became an American citizen or an American soldier who walked around with flowers in hand. Hmm. Wow. It's beautiful. I love it. Um, no, I, I want to answer your question too, Howie. Good. You know, so doctors and nurses are trained lots and lots of years and hours and hands-on, you know, lab and all kinds of stuff we get, right? But we're trained in the way that American society trains us, right? And American society does not focus on actually the causes for wellness, right? That's not a focus. So we get trained on, in medicine and in nursing, we get trained on you know, medications and treatments and procedures and therapies, and we don't get really trained on anything else. So when we are stressed ourselves, we turn to what we know, which may be uh, smoking. That, that's one other thing we do learn about. We learn about drinking because that's part of the society. We learn about eating, right? That's all comes before we go to school. And then we learn about what happens with our medical training. And that can go into, you can go to counseling. Um, you can, you know, take medications for anxiety or go to sleep. You know, there, we, we, are, we are creatures of our, of our profession, you know? So when we say, you know, doctors are not necessarily the healthiest and nurses certainly have um, a reputation for not being partic particularly healthy. A lot of morbidly obese nurses in the world. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're, we are, we're, we're, I don't know how you say that, you know, we're, we're creatures of, of our profession. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, one of the themes that I'm hearing in this conversation is that we're pretty much all creatures of, of our environment. So, you know, cardiologists, we talked about not being a jerk. I'm sure people don't go into medicine to be jerks, but it's a system that, you know, it's very hard not to be a jerk. <laughs> Right when you have six to nine minutes with a patient, it's very hard not to be obese if you grow up in an obesogenic environment. So one one of my questions I've been I've been thinking about this a lot. I've been listening to an education podcast, um, and the, it was a conversation with a guy who was who was criticizing a lot of sort of American popular psychology culture, things like grit and mindset, and saying like we're trying to teach grit and mindset, especially to disadvantaged kids. And that's great, that's great. And it's putting the blame on them as opposed to the system that is raising them to not 
you know, see a path forward or not to be engaged in their work. So I'm wondering, like, does anything you do with, with your, um, you know, African-American women Facebook group sort of tip into any sort of activism? Because there's a way in which, you know, African-American women are bearing the brunt of an awful lot in our society, you know, so tons of unpaid labor. And we see it not just in the home and in the community, we saw it politically in 2020, right? When like, you know, Afri you know, everyone was like, oh, thank you, African-American women for saving America for, you know, for the way you voted. It's like, okay, thank you. Now, what are you gonna do for me? And so in a sense, like, it's wonderful to, to work with them on an individual level, like here, here's things you could do, eat more vegetables. And yet there's still, you know, all these, systemic obstacles to equality. And I'm wondering, is, is there a way to, to acknowledge that, to deal with it? So it's not just, okay, it's all on you to fix yourselves. Yeah, so we do it, bring that up in the um, lives that we do. We talk about, um, you know, ways to manage the obstacles and the barriers that people confront, you know? so. For example, this is a really um, not on the level of activism, but in a way it is. So let's say uh, uh, somebody lives in an environment that's really noisy, chaotic, you know, mm -hmm. that impacts the health, right? And certainly in the framework of lifestyle medicine, it's, it's one of the pillars is to manage stress and, and emotional health, right? So we talk about um, how can you develop healthy sleeping habits and stress management. If a person, I know for me personally, when if I'm not managing my, my rest and my stress, I am not uh, at the top of my game, <laughs> let's mm -hmm. say. Uh, very difficult to have decent relationships with people or to manage how I'm eating. <clears throat> or any number of other things, you know, do I want to exercise? No, you know, if I'm, if I'm not sleeping well, do I have any in, um, interest in running or doing yoga? No, no, I want to sleep on the couch. I just want to lay around, right? So we talk about it like that. That at, for me is almost an act of rebellion or act um, being politically active. If you can manage yourself at that level, just your individual life, that has an impact on your entire household, which has, you know, okay, then it can spin, spin off into helping with your children, your partner. That's kind of how I look at it. Mm. Yeah, that reminds me a little bit of um, some of the work of Adrian Marie Brown, who talks about, like, she has a book called Pleasure Activism, which is like for, for, oppressed and marginalized people to feel good in your body is an act of rebellion. <laughs> yes. Nice. Yes. So how can people find your Facebook group and participate? I'll let Dr. Shah answer that one. So our Facebook page is called Healthy Living with Dr. Ajay Shah. And we periodically go also with Meryl's page also. So we have a both page here. We almost alternate each page so she can tell about her page also. But uh, we are live, like Meryl said, twice a month for sure, sometimes more. We are also on YouTube. So every episode so far we have done is already on YouTube channel, Healthy Living with Dr. Ajay Shah. Okay, and, and, we, gotta, and we gotta say your name has an extra A in it, right? So, yes. so they gotta look for A-A-J-A-Y. That's correct, yes. Okay, so was, was that so you could be at the top of the phone book? Top of the phone book, <laughs> okay. yes. Um, anyway, so so I think they can also look us up on the YouTube and, and Facebook. And uh, we are hoping to eventually have a more frequent uh, a small lives, both myself and Mara will do it, which will be in the segments of three to five minutes. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think I'm hoping to be more active on Facebook once I finish my job here, which is November 10th. After that, I'm gonna put Meryl to work. I'm gonna put myself to work and we'll be busy. Wow, okay, great. So Healthy Living with Dr. Ajay, A-A-J-A-Y Shah on um, Facebook and YouTube. And Meryl, what about you? 
Um, so we have it also on the um, plant-based nutrition movement uh, YouTube channel. So and uh, plant-based nutrition movement. movement. Yeah. Okay. YouTube. And the the lives themselves are called Black Health Rising. Black Health Rising. Great. I will uh, include links to everything in the show notes. Okay. But not every, not everybody goes there. Some people just listen, and so I want to make sure. Black Health Rising, plant based nutrition movement, the YouTube channel, and healthy living with Dr. Ajay Shah. And I assume um, there's no cost to get involved. No. No. No cost, no cost, yeah. No, Great. payment is, you know, we we hope that people take advantage of the information and can find a way to implement it in their lives. Mm -hmm. That's the big payoff. Great. I think the, the payment is gonna be in the form of every person who learns from us has to teach two more people. <laughs> oh, okay, I see, I see how the math works on that. I was gonna. I was gonna ask because you mentioned like you. You know, your goal is not to reach millions, but of maybe a few hundred, a couple thousand. And are you looking for other people to uh, clone your model in their own communities? So can 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 other practitioners come and steal all your secrets? Yeah, I think I think I agree. I think whatever we establish, any people can take it, steal it, learn from it, add to it improvise it. And I think we are all going to work together. I think uh, my, my and Meryl's job is to create many, many soldiers throughout the country in their own community. They go out and do what we are doing locally. I think, uh, <coughs> and to be honest with you, to have a paradigm shift in our healthcare, we need a grassroots movement. It cannot come from top down. It has to be from bottom up. That's what I personally see myself, that it has to be a demand created by where food companies, pharmaceutical companies, hospitals will sense the demand of the people that they are looking for a healthy lifestyle as a demand. Just like when we have a, a, a burger and impossible burgers and those kind of things coming up. And now those companies are flourishing. Plant-based milk is flourishing because uh, because there's so much big demand for it. Same way, I personally believe that if we create throughout the country a demand for practitioners of healthy lifestyle, then we will get paid what we are going to do in the future. Right now, we don't get paid for it. But government will realize it, insurance companies will realize it, there's a demand for it, and there will be a pay for it. I love it. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, Meryl, any final thoughts before we sign off? Not really. You know, oh, well, I will say one thing. You know, I, I come from a long line of people with dark brown skin, African Americans, right, in this country. And when, if I can make any difference for people that look like me or people in my family or people in the neighborhoods where I grew up and I've spent time and, you know, that's really the off for me, you know, to be able to help, like Ajay said, said, you know, it's even just one person in a month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm thrilled, you know, one person in six months, I'm overjoyed, honestly, that's, that's what it's about, really, you know, actually, just working with a, one of my cousins, she has a son who's 15 years old, who was just in ICU for a week, a couple of weeks ago, because he's 300 and something pounds, and went into um, ketoacidosis. Mm. Terrible, terrible. Um, he is out of the hospital now and um, working with him on text messages mostly um, just to try and get his diet under control. If that, you know, if that is the difference we can make one person at a time, you know, like I said, mm. that's what my is for this time. Beautiful. Well, um, thank you both. It's amazing work you're doing. Um, I'll have to I'll have to pop on and say hello and uh, 
lurk and learn a little bit. Um, so thank you yeah. for yeah, for your for your advocacy, for your curiosity, for the passion you bring to it, and for taking the time today. Yeah, thank you. It was a wide pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, always great to talk with you, Howie. Thanks so you, much. You too. Um, I gotta run. I'll see you guys soon. I hope. Peace. Okay. Thank you. Right. Bye. 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 Bye.